tell us about yourself. So I am the CTO for IBM Systems and a Vice President in charge of IBM Q. So cool. commercializing this wonderful piece of technology. What is this piece of like give us the like tell us what is this piece of technology here? So this is the the cold part of a quantum computer. So the quantum processor is at the bottom, um, and the temperature that, down that little, the that little thing little down, square there. down there. Yep. Wow. And that thing is needs to be kept a uh, hundred times colder than outer space. So really, really cold. And that's because you want the little qubits down there to only interact with um, the microwave signals that you send into it, not with the rest of the universe. Yeah. And if it's any warmer than that, it'll start entangling with everything else in the universe and you'll lose your quantum state. Gotcha. And so we've, we've heard a lot about this and we've spoken to quite a few people, so that, you know, the idea that a quantum computer, you know, it's got multiple states and so it's like yep. kind of, tell us like, you know, in, 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 from your perspective, Scott, like what, you know, why is a quantum computer faster than a normal computer? Yeah, so it's not so much doing the same thing faster, it does something, com does it completely differently. So in a classical computer, um, even when you're like counting on your fingers, it's linear. So if you want to count 10 chickens, you need 10 fingers. In a quantum computer, because of the superposition, um, because you can basically be in a um, linear combination of states, every time you add a qubit, you double the number of states you can be in. So that's true whether you go from one to two, or 50 to 51, or 100 to 101. And we don't kind of think of the world that way, but two to the 50th is like a huge number. Massive. It's like a quadrillion. And like two to the 150th, 160th, is like on the same scale as the number of atoms on the planet Earth. And like two to like 280th is like larger than the number of atoms in the known universe. Wow. So when you get to like a system in the future, when you got like 300 qubits down there, mm -hmm. you're basically talking about a state space that's like bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So you're never going to build a classic computer that's that big. Okay. So, so Scott, what's what's a what's a quantum computer really good at? Like, what's it like? What's like the like you know the the the, yep. the, the key case? Yep. So it's just like um, uh, the way that it works. It's those kind of problems. The problems that scale really poorly. So every time you add a variable, it doubles in size. So a good example of that is chemistry, because the the you know, molecular chemistry works just like quantum. It's based on quantum physics, mechanics. So every time you add an electron, the number of terms in your equation to describe it doubles. Oh. So when you get to like 160 electrons, like caffeine has, the classical computer that you would need to fit all that information in would take up like every atom on the planet Earth would need to be a bit. <laughs> and there's other problems like that too, like. Um, optimization problems like um, you know I want to travel to like 50 cities what's the right way to go that kind of problem sounds simple but it actually doubles every time you add a city is that like the backpack problem as well yeah, yeah. knapsack problem mm -hmm. uh, traveling Traveling. salesman problem yeah. all those kind of problems that blow up on you okay so so, so, yeah. so the, what kind of problems today yep. have you solved using a quantum computer so we solved like toy problems for all those kind of things, like a toy problem for optimization, a toy problem for materials, you know, a toy problem for machine learning, but they're not big enough yet to have real business value more than classical. But because of the way that they scale, you know, you don't have to get too big before you start getting really interesting. Wow. So we don't think it's going to be like the next year, but we do think within the next decade, you're going to have systems that are big enough and high enough quality that you're going to start being able to do things you can't do classically. Okay. So, so we're looking a lot at, uh, and we're talking today at the, at, at, at the show about blockchains and cryptography yep. and how they relate to quantum computing. Yep. Uh, it's on tomorrow, so everyone come and listen in. Um, and um, can you tell us, you know, maybe describe to us, you know, why potentially is some cryptography vulnerable to a quantum computer? So one of the things that classical computers suck at is factoring, which is A times B equals C. A times B is easy for a classical computer to do, but if I give you C and ask you what are the two largest prime numbers A and B, you need to multiply together to get C. Classical computers suck at that because it's one of those exponential problems that blow up as you add the number of bits. Is that a Newtonian equation? 
Do you require a Newtonian equation to solve that? Like you need to check, is it this one or is that one, is it that one, is it that right, one, is right, that right. one? So you have to go through all, the, in a classical computer, yeah. you have to go through every single possibility yeah. to be sure that you got the two right numbers, okay. right? In a quantum computer, you can leverage like the superposition entanglement to do it in a completely different way. Um, and people have proven when quantum computers get big enough and good enough, you'll be able to do something that takes millions of years on a classical computer in like 100 seconds on a quantum computer. Wow. So the good news for our credit cards is that's like far off okay. because they need to be really big. Yep. But you need to start worrying about it now because a lot of companies have data that they need to keep around secure for decades. So even though it might be decades before quantum computers could do that, we need to start coming up with new ways of doing cryptography that are quantum safe. So is that because, um, so we've been, we've been hearing a lot about like, um, potential risks of uh, historical data being captured yep. and then replayed back and potentially being un insensitive. Um, it, it, you know, is, is that something you guys are looking at? And, and how does yep. one consider, you know, I guess, is this the next Y2K? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there is some truth to that. I mean, you know, hopefully it's not over as overblown as Y2K was. <laughs> right? um, but yeah, I mean, it's something that people have to start thinking about. And, um, you know, IBM and others have come up with um, more quantum safe methods of doing asymmetric cryptology. Um, like a lattice method is one of the methods. And NIST is looking at a whole bunch of alternatives to come up with a new standard that's, you know, quantum safe. That's the uh, Kyber. Uh, Things uh, like that, right? Yep. So, Kyber algorithm, I believe it's called. Right, right. And the crystal algorithms, like you know, lithium crystal, those kind of things. Exactly right. Um, so, like over the next five or years or so, we're going to probably come up with standards for quantum safe cryptography that people will have to start implementing. Okay. Excellent, Scott. Thank you so much oh, for taking pleasure. the time, and that my was pleasure. really great. Oh, my pleasure.